Okay, as Ryan said, I have seven children. Six are autistic, the seventh is severely dyslexic, and the two youngest also have cerebral palsy, as well as their autism. Thank you, Ryan, I need that. <laughs> I want you to humor me for a moment. Could I just ask you to please just conjure up a picture in your mind of what that description looks like to you? Just think. Yeah? You got a picture? Help. <laughs> Sorry. Does it look something like that? <laughs> yeah? Do you know, a lot of people, when I talk about my family or describe my children. A huge number of people see kids who are socially totally inept, completely out of control, who have no understanding of the real world. They think my life must be almost impossible. They actually pity me and pity my children. I've even had people say to me that life can't be worth living. So here's a picture of my real children. Now, when you heard that description, is that really what you pictured, or was it more like the Adams family? And if it was more like the Adams family, you're totally forgiven. It's a, it's a funny thing. These words like autism, dyslexia, ADHD, OCD, bipolar, they all conjure up quite negative images in our minds. And it was because of those negative images that a lady called Judy Singer, who was a sociologist, in the late 1990s coined the phrase neuro, or the word, neurodivergent. And it was her hope that, at a stroke, she could change people's perceptions away from the disorders and impairments of people with atypical brains, and more towards the talents and abilities that they have. And my own children, run, they founded and run their own very successful award-winning business. They're a girl band called Relative Blue, and they've also won so many sporting and academic medals and trophies that the cabinet that I had to buy to house them all is heaving with the strain. So Judy Singer hoped that she could change people's perceptions but obviously, it wasn't going to happen overnight. Changing one word wasn't going to change everyone's very deeply ingrained ideas of what these words mean. But what has happened is neurodivergence has given people with atypical brains a generic term that they can use to describe themselves if they feel more comfortable with that. So am I saying we should do away with labels? No, I'm not. But a label or a diagnosis should be a reference point. It should be a starting point. It should be a point from which we can say, this person is autistic, so it's possible they struggle in these particular areas, so we can help them with those. And none of these things should be seen as diseases. None of these conditions should ever be seen as diseases. And actually, if it weren't for John Nash, who was the subject of the film A Beautiful Mind, who experienced extreme paranoid schizophrenia, we wouldn't have a lot of the mathematical systems that our modern computer industry and military use even to this day. It's a well-known fact that there is a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs who are also dyslexic. And studies have shown that the reason for this is that because their brains don't quite work in the same way in certain areas, the brain develops in other areas, and they become extremely creative. And my own daughter, Casey, is severely dyslexic. But it hasn't held her back in her chosen field of fashion design. In fact, it could be said that it's actually enabled her. She actually made my dress, which I hope you like. Casey is extremely creative, but she also has very formidable spatial skills. She can picture an item of clothing in her mind, and then she can convert that picture into the actuality of the garment. And I have to say that I'm extremely grateful to Richard Branson for being so open about his dyslexia, because he's given me an icon that I can hold up in front of Casey and say, Casey, look what Richard Branson's done. Imagine what you can do. And she now says to me, Mum, 
if Richard Branson can do it, I can do it. <laughs> kind of gone for a circle on me. But Richard Branson is incredibly creative. There's no denying that. Richard Branson has brought us some of the most creative and different things that we've ever known. He brought us tubular bells. He's now bringing us space tourism. He also brought us the Sex Pistols. Now, whatever your feelings about the Sex Pistols, it doesn't really matter, because the reality is that they were extremely different for their time. But it's also a fact that they actually ended up defining an entire generation. So Richard got it right. Silicon Valley is full of people on the autistic spectrum. Computers seem to be an area where their brains work extremely well in that kind of environment. But it's not the only area where their brains work extremely well. There is actually a firm of architects near here who actively seek out people on the autistic spectrum to work for them. They've recognized that their focus and their ability to see patterns is extremely useful in their particular industry. And it's widely believed now that both Mozart and Einstein were on the autistic spectrum. And that would certainly explain why they were both so focused and such radical thinkers. And we need radical thinkers. We desperately need radical thinkers. We need people who are not only capable of radical and creative thinking, we need people who aren't held back by social convention, people who aren't afraid to express their ideas, people who aren't fearful of the backlash of public opinion. And so, to a large extent, neurodivergence drives innovation. And Bert Belbin, I don't know if it's Dr. Belbin, but, Bel but Meredith Belbin did a huge amount of research on teams, and not just teams, effective teams. And he discovered in his research that a, an effective team is made up of numerous different components. But the one person that no team could be as effective without was the one he called the plant. And he called this person the plant because he planted one into every single team he worked with. Now, the plant was someone who was a radical thinker, a bit of a loose cannon, very, very creative. And what he discovered was that every team needed this person in order to be as effective as they could possibly be. So, how do we nurture these people? How do we nurture our neurodivergent population? who so often feel so alienated in our world, who don't quite fit into our neurotypical way of doing things, who find the way we live a little bit strange and everything a little bit too much for them. I think we need to look at workplaces. We need to make minor adjustments that will allow them to feel more comfortable. We need to look at our education system. We need to start teaching the person not the condition, not dealing with the behavior, but helping the person underneath and the abilities they have. And there's so much we could do to make these two people feel comfortable and not feel as if they're, they don't fit in. They don't deserve to feel that way. They have immense qualities and attributes. So we need better understanding. We need to value these people alongside everyone else. Every person should feel valued as having something to contribute to society. And so we need to enable them, not disable them. We need to make them feel as though they have something valuable to offer. And am I saying that neurotypical people aren't capable of being creative? No, of course I'm not. That would be ridiculous. But what I am saying is that neurodivergent people because of their differences, are so often overlooked or sidelined and not given the opportunities they should be given because the perception is that they will struggle in every area just because of some areas that they may have challenges with. So, my daughter Nikita, who I love dearly, Nikita's quite severely autistic. And when she was about nine, we had a psychologist visiting the house who was actually doing some work with Osborne, who was struggling with some of his difficulties with autism. 
And while she was there, Nikita went into meltdown. Now, this was a regular thing. It happened a lot. And the psychologist said to me that she had never, ever witnessed such extreme behavior in a child on the autistic spectrum. And that really frightened me. But you see, Nikita would, she would not only go into meltdown, she would shut down completely. She, you couldn't break through to her. She couldn't express her feelings. She couldn't verbalize her needs. She, she couldn't tell you what she needed. And her compulsions were absolutely paralyzing for her. And I must be, I must be brutally honest. Well, I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed now to admit. I actually wrote Nikita off. I didn't believe that she could ever live anything resembling a normal life. And I'd been told by professionals that she would one day need full-time residential care. And I believe that. It's a terrible thing to feel that you wrote your own, your own child off. But because of her struggles, I applied to the local authority, and I managed to get a statement for her. And Nikita started at a wonderful special school near here in Warwick. And they were fantastic with her, even though she didn't look at anyone or talk to anyone for months and months and months when she started there. They were absolutely brilliant at encouraging Nikita to take part in all sorts of different extracurricular activities. <laughs> Excuse me. And they would take her on all sorts of events, and they would take her on Special Olympic events all over the country, sometimes in big stadiums. And she was on one such event one day, and I went to pick her up. And everyone, the coach, the teachers, were all jumping around like two-year-olds. And they told me that Nikita had won four gold medals that day. Now, I was overjoyed, because here was a child who was struggling and failing at every single way. And maybe, maybe we'd found something that she was actually really good at, something that we could focus on and bring her up in and, and give her something positive. But on the drive home, she started to cry. So I asked her what was wrong, and I didn't really expect an answer. Nikita normally couldn't tell you what was wrong. She couldn't explain her feelings. But on this particular occasion, she could. And what she told me was heartbreaking. She said, I hate being disabled and I hate going to special school. And for me, that was heartbreaking, because there was nothing, nothing I could do to solve those problems. So, I thought for a minute, and I said to her, Nikita, you know there are some things that I'm good at that you're not very good at, and you know there are some things you're really good at that I'm really not good at. I said, if there are things that I'm good at that you're not, and things that you're good at that I'm not, does that mean I'm disabled as well? And she looked at me with her quizzical look, and she said, well, you're not disabled. I said, no, I'm not. She said, hmm, well, maybe I'm not then. And that was a massively defining point in Nikita's life, because I started to see an imperceptible change in her. I started to see her, see herself with, as a person with abilities rather than as someone who is disabled. <laughs> and then year 11 came, we were looking at what she would do next. I had my own very definite ideas about what Nikita was going to do in year 12. She was going to stay at school, do sixth form, and have a year to develop in confidence and life skills. I didn't reckon on Nikita having very, very different ideas, and I certainly didn't reckon on her determination, because Nikita had decided she was going to mainstream college 20 miles away to do performing arts, following in the footsteps of three of her older sisters. And there was no budging her. So in the end, I had no choice but to give in and agree. 
The day she was due to start, I woke up to the sound of Nikita being violently sick in the bathroom. The anxiety had completely taken over. I got her in the car, we drove to college, we pulled up. I said, right, let's go in. She said, no, I've changed my mind. I'm not going. So she was about to give up on her dream. So I wasn't having that. So I cajoled and begged, and eventually I tricked her to go into the college. And she stayed the whole day. I didn't get the phone call. And when I picked her up, she came out, and she looked quite, um, she looked quite happy. And I said, how did it go? She said, OK. I said, what did you do? She said, well, we had to do an icebreaker. We had to tell people something about ourselves and tell people what we thought our greatest strength was. Now, before Nikita started college, her biggest, biggest worry was whether or not to tell people about her autism, because she knew that potentially people knowing that could define their opinion of her for the next three years, and she didn't want that. But she said when it came to her turn, she decided in that moment to tell everyone. And she told them not only that she's autistic, she also told them that she saw her autism as being her biggest strength. And in that moment, Nikita took total ownership of who she is. And I know how much courage that took. And how far has she come since the time I was told she would need full-time residential care? And I love, I adore all my children but I respect them so much because each and every one of them have done the same. They've taken total ownership of who they are. They will happily tell people about their particular neurodivergence. They don't have any problem with it. And if they upset someone or they say something inappropriate, they'll just say to people, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to upset you, but I'm autistic and social skills aren't my forte. And so, please, we have more than enough evidence that neurodivergent people have so much to offer society. Isn't it time we started to recognize them for their talents and abilities and not see only their shortcomings? Isn't it time we nurtured them and brought out the best in them and helped them? And really, isn't it time that we changed our perceptions and our attitudes towards mental health on absolutely every level. Thank you.